we have one more uh, lemma to go in this lecture and uh, good news is it's going to be very easy to prove and you know the result is also quite important so uh, I, I guess let me just start out just kind of reading what we have so we're once again starting out with these one-step transition probabilities PXYs and um, you know and we also have this pi which is uh, a distribution you can see that because it's not negative and sums to one right so pi is a distribution and it satisfies in addition this this um, thing in the box right condition star I put a star right on the side there so these are if you remember from a few clips back uh, these are called local balance uh, conditions and we saw at that point that or at least we stated at that point that um, you know satisfying those was enough to establish that pi is, uh, is a stationary distribution but we never quite said what its relation to the other condition was right namely global balance right we had two conditions and global balance is the one that we've been using in the last kind of few clips to prove various lemmas but for now uh, uh, you know we want to understand the relationship between the two and in the third line that's what's being established it essentially says that local balance implies global balance but not conversely right so um, you know pi satisfies the global balance conditions right pi satisfying star that is but the other way around uh, will not work so before moving to the proof you know I want to kind of say that you know this local balance um, definition relates to something called reversibility right so a Markov chain for which star namely local balance holds is called um, reversible and you know this plays a big role uh, you know once again in the, in the theory of physics that's where all this stuff is, is coming from um, and it has to do with sort of reversible and irreversible processes right and kind of you know, irreversible processes are not ones that you can kind of recover back to, to some original state and um, I'm sure you can think of many examples of physical processes that you know kind of seem to be reversible and others that seem to just not be so uh, you know what's uh, we're gonna we are gonna have kind of a, a lecture on this to, to dig into the details but for now maybe I can relate this uh, local balance condition for you to essentially what is a conservation law <clears throat> so in physics conservation laws uh, play a big role right there's that conservation of you know momentum conservation of energy right all these um, kind of various concepts and this is another example of it and here the way you think about it is sort of like pi x is the pi x is the amount of um, uh, the amount of you know, stuff right something that we're conserving at uh, location x and pxy is uh, the the fraction of it that's going to be sent over to location y and then conversely right you see that that's equal to the stuff that's at location y that's pi y the amount of stuff in location y and it's multiplied by pyx which is the fraction of stuff to be sent over to x and though, so it's kind of like a conservation of flow where the stuff leaving uh, site or location x is going to be matched right um, by the um, stuff that's moving from y uh, into x and that was uh, a property of the uh, Erdfest urn that we saw in the first lecture uh, there, you know, you had kind of particles of gas exchanging between the two urns, and so, you know, you can kind of show there that um, the amounts of them are balanced in some way. Um, and that has to do with the reversibility of that process, which was kind of important in, in the development of that um, urn example. In any case, I think let's get to the, to the proof uh, now. So, you know what do we want to do we want to start with local balance its equation star and we want to get to the global balance condition um, and hopefully you remember what that is we've been using it in the last couple of segments to, to prove various lemmas um, it is essentially a condition just like this one but with mu replaced by pi and we'll return to this in one minute so um, so how do we prove this right we, we want to start with that and end up with global balance and again I'm going to kind of encourage you to sometimes just start with the right hand side and not the left hand side even though here it doesn't matter but you know there's not always a necessity to go from left to right so I'm going to start with this side 
which is what I wrote down there, and then I'm going to sum over x, and then I'm going to, therefore, sum whatever this is equal to over x, right? So this sum is exactly the same as this one, and because that is equal to this, per pair xy, I have x, y here. Right? So, you know, all that's actually, well, all that's happened is that I, I've summed both sides of this over, um, over x. So how did I know how to do that? Well, you know, I kind of recognize that this is something that's one of the summons in the global balance condition, and now I have sort of one part of the global balance condition. And the only question is whether that one is equal to pi y. And hopefully you see that, that it is. The pi y will come out of the sum. And these are transition probabilities that say, what is the probability of going from y to x summed over every single possible location x? And so since the chain had to go somewhere, that sum is in fact 1. So if I took this out of the sum for a minute over there, this sum is in fact 1. Right, because the chain had to go somewhere, right, summing up over all possible states, and we immediately get pi y. So we'll see examples where um, the converse doesn't hold. Um, you know, there's a kind of a, a nice analogy on um, uh, with these chains where. Uh, the idea of a reversible chain is that when you watch it moving forwards or backwards of time, you can't tell the difference. Whereas uh, with chains that are not reversible, right, they may satisfy global balance, but they don't satisfy local balance. You can see them kind of, um, you, you know, um, evolve one way in time or the other way in time, and, and know exactly if time is going forward or backwards based on what you're observing. So that's kind of a little bit of intuition that we'll get into um, later. For now, I just kind of want to say, if you're verifying you know, that something is a stationary distribution or you're trying to find um, the stationary distribution, and this is going to be the topic of the next uh, lecture, just working through a lot of examples of computing the stationary distribution, it's uh, often um, kind of pays to, to start with this simpler condition. So kind of local balance is a bit more friendly to work with, right? It doesn't have this big complicated sum around it. And so, you know, it's certainly a useful um, kind of condition to rely on. And once you failed sort of, um, once you failed in either verifying or, or computing it using the local balance condition, then you can always come back to, to global balance and try to, to see if that works, right? This one is much more complicated. It involves a, a sum over a lot of different states. Um, However, sometimes you do have to resort to, to, to trying to solve this set of equations, and we'll definitely do that in the next lecture. I have a number of examples where you, you know, we work through those calculations. And there, I'm going to make a suggestion that we actually work with something that is uh, a concept very related to stationary distributions, but they're called stationary uh, measures. So I'm going to call a function mu from the state space to now the half line, right? So it's no longer a function from zero to one, which would be a probability, but uh, it's a function from zero to, to infinity, not including infinity. It's called a stationary measure, and that's a word that comes out of um, measure theory, but, you know, which is a complicated topic, but here it's not, it's actually gonna make life easier for us. You'll see that the condition that it needs to satisfy in order to be, um, uh, you know, in order to be called stationary is the same global balance condition. And the only real difference between the two is that while this one is, um, uh, you know, while the, the entries of the pi sum to one, these one don't have to. Right? They can be anything um, you like. And in fact, uh, you know, what what's going to turn out um, uh, to happen here is that you because of you know because of this looser property you get one of these essentially for free meaning that you can always assume you know for example that mu zero is equal to uh, 
you know, one or any other number, right? It doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. You can multiply both sides here by, you know, 100, and this condition will still be, um, will still be met. And the point of this is sort of the a suggestion that um, in computing um, stationary distributions, it's always much easier to work to find first the stationary measure and then um, find from that the stationary distribution. Right? And the reason is that this pi y here, once you have a stationary measure, is equal to mu y divided by the sum of mu um, right over all the mu's. Right? It's just all I'm doing here is I'm normalizing. And so, you know, it shouldn't be, and this is this could be a kind of a separate exercise for you to, to kind of practice on, um, which is that um, try to show that you know if mu satisfies this condition, then pi must be a stationary measure, right? And what you'll see is that the global condition, the global balance conditions are still met, and it's very easy to see that the sum of this over y is equal to to one. Right, which is exactly what you need for a distribution. So, um, so let's wrap it up here and, and then do a bit of an overview for, for this lecture. And the next lecture is going to be all about um, computing stationary distributions.